Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a patron and support the podcast, please just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the History Network. Thank you so much. The History Network.org podcast, Season 30, Episode 2, The Vicksburg Campaign, Part 2. This episode was written by J. A. Henderson. Major Henderson holds a Master's of Arts in International Relations from the University of Oklahoma and recently completed a Master's of Military Arts and Sciences from the United States Army's Command and General Staff College, where his thesis focused on operational level leadership. He has also previously written Episode 6 of Season 28, Lieutenant General Sir Geoffrey Amherst and the Conquest of New France. On May 18th, 1863, Major General Ulysses S. Grant achieved the objective he had sought for months. Union troops surrounded Vicksburg on three sides, and on its west side, Admiral David Porter's warships controlled the waters of the Mississippi. For three months, Confederate Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton had watched as Grant flailed about in the floodplain on various unsuccessful Bayou expeditions. Then, beginning April 30th, 1863, in just three weeks, Grant's army marched 180 miles, fought and won five battles, and finally surrounded Vicksburg itself, trapping 31,000 Confederates. Of all the tributes Grant received, the one he appreciated most came from his friend, Major General William Tecumseh Sherman. Until this moment, I never thought your expedition a success, Sherman told Grant. I never could see the end clearly until now, but this is a campaign. This is a success. If we never take the town... Now within Vicksburg's fortifications, the defeated Confederate army was much renewed. Although cut off, Pemberton was reinforced by two fresh divisions who had been left behind to guard the fortress. Additionally, he was able to refit his other two exhausted divisions from a stockpile of weapons and supplies. The fortifications themselves similarly inspired confidence with nine major strong points and 102 artillery pieces. In many places, the Southerners could lay down a heavy crossfire, as well as frontal fire. Grant was undeterred, though, and ordered a hasty assault for May 19th. One vigorous attack might just break the Confederates decisively and conclude the campaign. After a five-hour artillery preparation, Sherman's men launched their assault, only to be raked and thrown back by enfilading fire. An officer wrote, The leaden hail from the enemy was absolutely blinding. The very chips and sticks scattered over the ground were jumping under the hot shower of rebel bullets. Only one unit, 1st Battalion of the 13th US Infantry, was able to reach the enemy works, and the colour-bearer planted the unit's colours, on the fortified Redan before retreating. For this act, the 13th Infantry was officially accorded the honour first at Vicksburg. Wishing above all else to avoid a prolonged siege, Grant attempted a second attack on May 22nd. Although Sherman had attacked alone on the 19th, the attack on the 22nd was a coordinated assault involving all three of Grant's corps, Sherman's 15 Corps, Major General John McClernand's 13 Corps, and Major General James B. McPherson's 17 Corps. Despite prolonged preparatory fires and a carefully synchronised attack, the Union soldiers failed to take the Confederate positions. Grant lost another 502 killed, 2,550 wounded, and 147 missing. One Union soldier summed up the assault in his diary. Thus ended another day of bloody fight in vain, except for an increase of the knowledge that a regular siege will be required to take Vicksburg. 
Though the attacks had failed, Grant did not consider these assaults a mistake. He explained, The men believed they could carry the works in their front, and they would not afterwards have worked so patiently in the trenches if they had not been allowed to try. Grant had no doubt of ultimate success, though. On May 24th, he informed General Halleck that the enemy was in our grasp, the fall of Vicksburg and the capture of most of the garrison can only be a question of time. Not all of Grant's commanders would be present for his final victory, though. Major General John McClernand had been at odds with Grant ever since the former's appointment to the Western Theatre. The problem was that John McClernand, although he wore a uniform, was still a politician. As journalist Charles Dana reported to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, McClernand was not fit even to command a regiment and had proven beyond a doubt that he was not qualified to command a corps. Beginning on the wrong foot with Grant's assertion of command over McClernand's army of the Mississippi, over the months the relationship continued to sour. On May 30th came the final straw, McClernand issued a congratulatory order to the troops of his 13th Corps, in which he not only lauded his own troops for their role in the May 22nd assault, but downplayed the role of the rest of Grant's army. This order found its way into the northern newspapers without first being cleared through Grant's headquarters, as required by regulations. Grant seized on this opportunity to rid himself of his troublesome subordinate, and on June 18th, Grant relieved McClernand of command and assigned Major General Edward Ord to command the 13th Corps. Ord had plenty of time to get acquainted with his new command. Over the next six weeks, the Union Army did more digging than fighting. Grant would write in his memoirs, I now determined upon a regular siege to out-camp the enemy, as it were, and to incur no more losses. The experience of the 22nd convinced officers and men that this was best, and they went to work on the defences and approaches with will. With the navy holding the river, the investment of Vicksburg was complete. Both besiegers and besieged tried different tactics to hasten an end to the conflict, including sniping, mining and limited assaults, but the majority of the siege was one of boredom and unrelenting artillery fire. From out in the river, the hundred cannon aboard Admiral Porter's gunboats fired shells into the fortified city at all hours, and Grant's 220 cannon and mortars joined in from the landward side. There was little rest for either defenders or citizens as shells rained down day and night. One civilian wrote, People do nothing but eat what they can get, sleep when they can, and dodge the shells. The Confederate artillery could not retaliate in kind, as Pemberton directed his gunners to conserve their ammunition for the inevitable Union assaults to come. Every day the Confederates watched the Union army steadily pressing the approach trenches closer and closer to their defences. As the siege wore on, conditions within the Confederate lines deteriorated. Noted one Confederate, when the siege commenced it had been announced that there were provisions enough stored away to subsist the army for six months. In reality such was not the case. Food rations were cut, and cut again to conserve stockpiles. Malnutrition and disease decimated the Confederate ranks. Even Sherman wrote that he pitied the poor families in Vicksburg, where women and children are living in caves and holes underground while our shot and shells tear through their houses overhead. He said Vicksburg had to be a horrid place. All the while the Union forces continued to grow. Grant drew more troops from Memphis, bolstering his total force to some 75,000. There were no such reinforcements for the Confederates, however. Any outside relief for Pemberton would have come from General Joseph Johnston, but Johnston showed no inclination to attack the Union forces. Lieutenant General Kirby Smith mounted a series of limited and disjointed attacks against the Union base at Milliken's Bend, 
but was repulsed. In any case, these supply bases, which Smith had so effectively raided in the fall of 1862, no longer held the same importance to Grant's army. As the weeks passed and Johnston did not come, spirits inside Vicksburg sagged. The tone of the Vicksburg newspaper, which by this time was reduced in size to a square foot and printed on wallpaper, changed from confidence to complaint. In the last week of June, it was no longer, Johnston is coming, but where is Johnston? The Confederate strategy throughout the campaign was characterised by divided councils and paralysis in the face of Grant's unexpected and rapid movements. Johnston continually sought to concentrate superior numbers against Grant and beat him in the field, after which the Confederates could reoccupy Vicksburg without fear of Union attack. This strategy conflicted with what Pemberton believed to be his mission. He had orders to hold Vicksburg, and he intended to do so by shielding it with his army. Before the two southern generals could ever agree on a plan, Grant made the matter moot by interposing his army between their forces. He prevented Pemberton's one attempt to link up at Champions Hill, and Johnston never again made a serious attempt to relieve the trapped defenders. Johnston had never shared the belief in himself as deliverer. I consider saving Vicksburg hopeless, he informed the War Department on June 15th. Confederate Secretary of War James Seddon was aghast at Johnston's message and wired back that Vicksburg must not be lost without a desperate struggle. The honour of the Confederacy forbid it. You must hazard attack. The eyes and hopes of the whole Confederacy are upon you. But Johnston considered his force too weak. He shifted the burden to Pemberton, urging him to try a breakout attack or to escape across the river. At the end of June, in response to frantic pressure from Richmond, Johnston began to probe feebly towards Vicksburg. Johnston's rescue attempt was too little too late, though. By the time he was ready to take action, Pemberton had already surrendered. By July 1st, Grant's lines had been pushed so close to the enemy that in some places only a few yards separated the antagonists. Grant gave orders to prepare for an assault on July 6th but the assault would never come. On June 28th, Pemberton received a mysterious letter signed Many Soldiers, stating that the army had reached the limits of endurance. If you can't feed us, you had better surrender than suffer this noble army to disgrace themselves by desertion. This army is now ripe for mutiny unless it can be fed. Pemberton consulted his division commanders, who assured him that their sick and malnourished men could not attempt a breakout attack. On July 3rd, Pemberton bowed to the inevitable outcome and asked Grant for terms. Pemberton remarked to his staff, I am a northern man, and I know my people. I know we can get better terms from them on the 4th of July than on any other day of the year. At ten in the morning, on July 4th, 1863, Pemberton had the Confederate stars and bars lowered and the stars and stripes raised, ending the 47-day siege. The Confederate troops marched out of their positions and stacked arms. Grant observed of his own men, not a cheer went up, not a remark was made that would cause pain. Instead, the Union troops took pity on their defeated and miserable foe moving forward among the disarmed Confederates to give them food and share their kettles of coffee. The fall of Vicksburg inflicted irreparable damage on the Confederate States of America. The South was now cut in two, just as Confederate President Jefferson Davis had feared. Military operations east and west of the Mississippi would, from this point on, take place in isolation from each other, and the loss of the western waterways seriously crippled the Confederacy's internal transportation system. Union gunboats now patrolled the entire length of the Mississippi, constituting nothing less than an internal blockade of the Confederacy. To the population of the South, as to the world at large, the Confederate government in Richmond seemed less and less able to defend its citizens or its territory. If Vicksburg could fall so readily, what place in the Confederacy was safe 
from the marauding Union armies. Additionally, the surrender of Pemberton's army of the Mississippi removed 29,000 soldiers from combat, which could not be replaced. Grant was correct in his later assertion that the fate of the Confederacy was sealed when Vicksburg fell. The successful conclusion of the Vicksburg campaign had a correspondingly positive impact on Union fortunes. Grant's Army of the Tennessee was now free to enter other theatres of the conflict and the Mississippi River was open to Union commercial and military shipping all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Abraham Lincoln said of the pivotal moment, The father of waters again goes unvexed to the sea. For all of its greatness, Vicksburg never attained the prominence in American culture enjoyed by the great battles waged in the Eastern Theatre and will always be overshadowed by the Union victory at Gettysburg which occurred just one day earlier. Vicksburg catapulted Grant to the top tier of Union generals and by the end of 1863 Grant commanded the entire Western Theatre. In 1864 he would be promoted to the position of General-in-Chief of the US Army and command all Union forces for their final victory over the Confederacy. Despite his ultimate success in winning the war, historians have often considered Vicksburg his finest campaign, imaginative, audacious, relentless, and a masterpiece of manoeuvre warfare. President Lincoln can be counted among those who were impressed by Grant's achievement. On July 13th, 1863, he wrote to Grant, My dear General, I do not remember that you and I ever met personally. I write this now as a grateful acknowledgement for the almost inestimable service you have done the country. When you first reached the vicinity of Vicksburg, I feared it was a mistake. I now wish to make the personal acknowledgement that you were right and I was wrong. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln. Well, thank you, Major Henderson, for writing that script for us. A great two-parter, I hope you will all agree. And if you'd like to write a script for us, and you have an idea for one, then drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. We would love to hear from you. Once again, if you would like to become a patron of the podcast and support us that way, then just pop along to patreon.com forward slash thehistorynetwork. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by J.A. Henderson, read by Nick Barker. Mm-hmm.